It's March 23rd in Geneva. We're at the World Health Organization. I'm talking to Nina. And uh, Nina, can you uh, start out by introducing yourself, telling people who you work for, uh, why you came to this meeting, and how you think things are going so far? Thank you, James. My name is Nina Jamal. I work at WorkPause, and I'm responsible for our work on pandemic prevention. How things are going so far um, is to some extent worrying because we know that 75% of emerging infectious diseases in humans emerge in animals, and we are not seeing enough progress on prevention and on health. And this is because developing countries are worried about the effort that it will take. They need to build the resilient health systems so in order for them to move beyond just preparing and responding for the next pandemic and finding resources to prevent the next pandemic, they're going to need help. And making sure that that support is available for member states is key. So this is one of the things that uh, we're hoping would progress. And this is on the content side. Then you have the process. On process, we have a situation where member states are not being fully open and transparent with each other on their positions. So they're basically repeating their official positions and they're not moving into real, honest negotiations about where they are flexible, what is especially important for them, what is less important for them. And this kind of communication is what we need to move the process forward. When, uh, when the March 7th text came out with uh, no brackets, and then you look at where things are at today. Uh, has your opinion changed about the uh, uh, probability of success of this negotiation? Well, the, the early March text showed a certain level of progress. And we are right now at a step backwards because member states are trying to water down different parts of the text for tactical reasons not for honest reasons. So we have moved a step back, but I'm still optimistic because we have to get this treaty done and it has to be a treaty that's win-win for, for all member states. And for that to happen, they need to be honest with each other. So if they remain stuck on their positions, we will not move forward. We will not reach a good treaty that supports all member states in preventing, preparing and responding to pandemics. So um, this is what we're here to do. We're here to have those conversations and uh, encourage member states to, to move towards uh, consensus. What are the most divisive parts of the, of the One Health uh, negotiation? So on One Health, there are a couple of elements that member states are worried about, but those can be clarified through more explicit text. So for example, data sharing. What kind of data gets shared within the country and what kind of data gets shared with the WHO. Here, what we are encouraging member states to do is to build their national systems based on their national priorities, based on their national circumstances, develop multi-sectoral coordination to share data within the country itself. And then their experts and epidemiologists can together jointly decide what kind of unusual public health events are critical enough to be shared with other member states. So this is one, one topic. And we believe member states do not have to share critical, all kinds of data that, that they have. They need to share just data that is critical to protect human health globally. Um, which countries have become the most active in the One Health uh, part, of the, part of the negotiation? This is the interesting thing developed countries are being vocal on One Health. However, we know that many developing countries who are doing a lot on One Health nationally could profit from good language on One Health, you know, where you have a system within the treaty that enables us to develop national action plans, prioritizing activities in the country that are high risk, that, uh, that they need support, financial technical support for, expert support for. A lot of member states could benefit from that support, but they're not being vocal in the negotiations for tactical reasons because One Health 
is about prevention and what they're most urgently keen to see move forward is preparedness and response. This is also partly because the stakeholders negotiating the process are the public health experts. They're not environmental experts, agriculture experts, animal health experts. Stakeholders who have the expertise to prevent pandemics are not part of the process. So this is one of the reasons why these developing countries who are doing a lot on One Health and who can benefit a lot from One Health language in the text that supports them in implementing what they need to do to protect their people. This is so. This is the reason why this is uh, this is not being uh, mentioned in the process. Uh, has anything surprised you uh, this week? What surprised me especially was um, the backtracking. You know, this, this tactical game, very late in the process. We have only a few days left of negotiation and playing a game of repeating old positions and intentionally watering down the text so that other parts of the text get strengthened. This doesn't lead anywhere. It just It's just like game of chicken where they're driving towards each other and waiting for the second one to blink. This is not how we get into a win-win kind of negotiation. Before I... Um uh, thank you, and, but before I, I turn off the video, is there uh, any, any last uh, thing you'd like to mention? Yes, if member states work together and are honest, they all stand to benefit from this negotiation. It can be historical. We are, we are at a stage where we've lived through an incredible crisis. Lots of people died, lots of people suffered, and member states have a unique opportunity to do everything they can to prevent that from happening again and they should not waste this opportunity. Thank you, Nina. Thank you very much. Thank you, James.